Good evening. Welcome to a very special Thursday night program on Cat Space. I'm Cat. This is Buckets Horsey and Jordan. Hi guys, how are you? <laughs> How are you going? Yeah, not too Hello. bad. No, I'm I'm well. On this, uh, what do they, they call it? Holy Thursday. Holy, that's right. Holy <laughs> Thursday. Blessed Holy Thursday. So tonight's topic is a very educational, very thought provoking, very serious conversation, and that is the psychological significance of the Bible. Now let's get into it. First questions first. What does the Bible mean to you? Uh, in of well, as psychological perspective. Yes. So uh, first, we'll better introduce um, uh, Jordan. So uh, Jordan, do you want to introduce yourself to the yeah. audience before we jump jump into some questions? Yes. Just quickly. Um, yeah, I'm Jordan Heath, and uh, I study electrical engineering. Um, but I've had a bit of a interest in psychological significance of the biblical stories at the moment. So yeah. <laughs> And he's Alrighty. going to talk to us about that, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. So, okay, let's rehash a question. What does the Bible mean to you uh, as a psychological pers uh, perspective for you? Um, so basically, we'll get a history of the, the Bible. So um, with uh, Nietzsche, uh, he suggested that over the course of thousands of years, um, uh, the European mind trained itself to interpret um, uh, everything that was known within a single coherent framework under the initial axioms. Um, so this gave the, this training gave the, the, uh, the collective mind of that time to transcend from that dogmatic foundation um, and then concentrate on the natural world. So um, when he announced that God was dead, um, he was basically, he didn't see that as triumphant, but um, uh, like most people think, but um, uh, he believed that this capacity for discipline that Christianity or Catholic is um, created uh, a self-imposed discipline that kind of uh, it's kind of akin from going to childhood to full-fledged adult. So you don't go instantly from childhood to adult. You have to self-impose discipline to 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 slowly get yourself into uh, into that. So he believed that the scientific revolution wouldn't have happened um, if it wasn't for Catholicism. Um, so. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't see God is dead as something triumphant because he foresaw that if you read the foundation of uh, Western civilization, um, uh, it would destabilize this collective dream um, uh, that we're embedded in. Um, uh, and it would kind of move back and forth between nihilism and extreme ideology which um and he predicted that in the 20th century that um uh, millions of people that would die because of this destabilization which we saw with the nazis and the gulag with the soviet union um so he, he predicted that in the late 18th 1800s so uh, like it's genius of him to to predict something like that um uh but uh, it's this stabilization happens because um, we have articulate representations of the world um, and then there are things that we know nothing about uh, and then the, the uh, area in between which is described as the dream so that's where like artists live artists live because um, they interpret this dream and then create their own world to describe the world um, in this manner. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we can know things at one level without being able to articulate it at, a, um, at another. So, um, uh, and this is done in like moods and images and actions. Um, so yeah, we're embedded in this dream in some sense. 
Um, so you're saying that there's a basic understanding common to everybody of, of yeah. life and, and the, the universe and everything and its meaning. Yeah, so um, with Catholicism, they, they trained this um, like whole society to think in a, a certain way. Oh, they um, certainly did. I'll agree with that. Yeah. In fact, I, I don't think, I personally don't think the Catholic Church, I've said this before, I don't think the Catholic Church is a good representation of what the message of the Bible is. No, not at all. And what the gospel is. <laughs> I think they, they're, great, they're great at controlling people, but they actually don't have hmm. much, to do with, much to do with Christianity. Um, in yeah, fact, the, they, the, the, saying, the saying is the Pope Catholic. I believe that's an oxymoron. If I, may, <laughs> if I may interject, <coughs> excuse me, if I may interject, um, what the Bible means to me psychologically is that um, when we look at the Bible or the study of the Bible or what the Bible tells us and how we should follow it, psychologically, the, the infrastructure of the, the stories that we read from the Bible or are told as children uh, and to young adults in adulthood and teaching our children and children is that some stories are pretty Intense, like I'm not going to lie, they're intense, and mm -hmm. some are joyful and some are intense and hard to swallow because, or hard to breathe in because there are some stories that you know go as far as I know this is far fetched talking, but let's talk about we're in Holy Week, so we're talking the passion about the passion of the Christ, passion of our Lord, where he. Well, the went, Easter story is pretty intense. Yeah, the Easter story is when you think of yeah. what, what what Jesus went through physically. Yeah, as as has been described, with how the Romans whipped someone and you know to within an inch yeah. of their life and then crucified them, um, and it's uh, it's, I mean, in terms of our psychology, our understanding of what that message means, and what what Jesus came to do, and the fact that on the Sunday morning he'd come back to life and no one found the body, that has a pretty big impact on how, on my psychology. I mean, on on. <laughs> adults psychologically it kind of when you sit and dwell on it or you think about it or you, you talk about it consistently or you just in your mind it it goes round and round in circles um it kind of makes you wonder about life about existence like mm. i know it's going mm. forward, but the passion for example um being that we're in holy week so i would say you know is it as as it is or are we just being told that when we watch, for example, the Passion of the Christ, take for example the intensity of it, it's it will knock your breath out. Like it'll literally just make you go, <gasps> and then hold that breath for as long as possible, and then just go, <sighs> you know. But the Bible is so intense; it's well, the, hard the concept to of si sin too um, is pretty has psychology because I mean the the message of the Bible says that no one no one's able to get to heaven on their own no one's what they should be able to do and save themselves only god can help with that and that more so it says that every human being that's ever been born is a sinner so what effect does that have on our psychology we're born and we grow up and we think oh we're good people and all of a sudden we're told by the church if they're if they're telling us the right thing that is in my view anyway that no no you're not a good person at all but for jesus christ you'd be going to hell so that has a pretty serious effect on most people's psychology yeah. to the extent that some say well okay if that's the case if that's what i'm being told then i'm not having any of this see you later mm -hmm. and they go their own way they can't accept that even though it's said by the by the message of the bible to be a free gift all you have to do is accept it people still can't accept it. I've always wondered why, because I reckon it's a great, it's great news, but other people say, no, no, I can't accept that. I, I, I'm too proud to accept that. So it plays hell with our psychology in a way. Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, one thing that I found interesting was, um, I think it was in 300 AD, so some of the founding fathers said, you should not interpret this literally think of it as mm. wise metaphors um so it, in a sense it's like we're talking about artists um 
it's an abstraction of human consciousness or human experience across all time. And then it's aimed towards the ideal uh, human being. Um, but that's why there's so much suffering and so much um, like in the Old Testament, God is quite cruel and, you know, arbitrary and um, quite demanding. Uh, but that's what kind of gives the book life because, you know, you don't think mother nature is oh, how to fly type of thing. Mother nature is also quite cruel. And um, well, God, that's, God's that's, also that's, gracious though. God is exactly. Yeah. So it, also um, gracious in the old Testament. I mean, what about what about yeah. the Israelites when they when they when he went up the mountain and Moses went up the mountain they made this they made this gold idol and they were falling down. Um, he he should have come yeah. down and should have killed them all for that, but he didn't. He said, "Right, oh well, you know that's not the right thing to do." But still, mm -hmm. there was forgiveness there. Yes, there's yes, God yeah. is fierce, but uh, when you look at why he is fierce and why why he he thunders from above in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. And why, I mean, why Jesus overturned the money changers table in the temple and why Jesus, when Jesus got angry, if you look behind it, there's always a good reason for it. Yeah. It's not just arbitrary in that sense, I don't think. Yeah, but it appears from the outside that, you know, because um, the Old Testament is quite, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> like incest and murder and like it, mm. it's quite a, a rough rough read but um i don't think things have changed mentor. these days i think that's that yeah. stuff still goes on we, we no, the same yeah, sin the same sins exist we just have new technology with which to do them mm -hmm. people yeah. have always been much the same yeah um but yeah so the the bible was made to try and represent human experience and then to tell you to kind of look the hell out because life isn't made to comfort you um so that's that kind of cruel side of god it's like you some people say oh why would you believe in a god that would have make cancer mm. or something but it, it's not the right question to ask um because you wouldn't say that about mother nature um so the point is of the bible i think is you know there is suffering in this world um mm. and you're meant to take that up and carry it and still aim towards the good um and not be resent like resentful and um because that's gonna lead you to a path that yeah. leaves more suffering for everyone including the person well, well, I, I think why you, why it? aim towards the good sorry why what's the purpose of that if you look um, at the so, message of the bible there's actually hmm. a purpose to it and the purpose is because god is god and humans are not and we can have some understanding of God from what we're told in the Bible, whether we can have that same understanding of mother nature. And then there's also the vexed question of whether mother nature is actually under God's control. So if we have some understanding of God, then um, we have some understanding of mother nature. But yeah, my question is what, what's the purpose? If you're, if you're aiming towards the good, it's no good unless there's a, there's a purpose in that. And if the purpose is, if the purpose is to give God his place as God and recognize that we're not actually in control, then that's a good purpose because we say, right, oh, well, we can't control these things. We can't, we can aim towards the good, but sometimes we don't do it and we don't even understand why. Yeah. If there's a purpose um, there, if there's no purpose and we're just searching for understanding, then I think that's a bit sad. Yeah. Well, I think the idea is because um, you, you do have people who are nihilistic about the world you know mm. we're just a trivial speck on a trivial speck um <laughs> so but well, then it the... doesn't it doesn't matter i mean i could i could then go and say right i'm going to i'm going to kill your sister just because i think it might be fun i'm going to go and grab a knife i'm going to find your sister i'm just going to murder her and i don't That's care about the consequences that and if 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 i'm if i'm being nihilistic about it then that it doesn't matter it actually doesn't matter. Yeah. Whereas if there are moral absolutes and absolute truths, um, yeah. as per the picture painted in the Bible, then it actually does matter. And that's what gives me, yeah. that's what gives me, why are you laughing, Kat? That's what gives me a conscience about it. And most people have a conscience. Yeah. 
And so the question yep. is, where does that come from? And in terms of our psychology, I think it's a very good question to investigate. Why are we given this yeah. natural understanding of what is right and wrong? Because if, these, if yeah. there is nothing there, then it, who, gives, who gives the monkeys? It doesn't matter what we do. We can do whatever we like, please ourselves yeah. if we can. No, yeah. no, for Jack for one second. Look, um, <laughs> yeah, just, just the, one second. The, the thing is, uh, in the Bible, it actually does say that um, his God has actually given us a choice. Mm. Now, the only issue with basically God giving us a choice uh, is the fact that it can't be a 100% perfect system because people mm. will do um, good things and yep. people do bad things because humans mm. are very selfish human beings that basically want to get ahead. And that's, and the, that's the nature of having a choice. That's yeah. the nature yep. of having a choice. So um, to basically say that, um, you know, uh, you know, you, to, to live in resentment or, um, or, or whatever, um, it, you know, that's the thing is that that's always going to kind of happen because mm. we're human, um, mm. because we have free choice, relatively speaking. I mean, yes, we have to yeah. obey the law, but then when we choose to obey the law, and if you don't um, obey the law, um, then you will break the law and things will happen to you. But that's within mm. the construct, basically. Um, and that that, that um, uh, system of law that we have, even in, in our secular society, mm. that actually comes from the moral absolutes in the Bible. You know, treat others as you would want to be treated. Treat others fairly and exist within a system that is fair, as if not all mm. of us. And um, accept the fact that you can't always do exactly what you want to do. Like everybody always wants to go through green lights, okay? You can't always do that. And we accept the fact that we can't do that because there's the risk there that if we go through a red light, there'll be a problem as in an accident and that'll be worse for us than having to stop for a few minutes. Um, but we, we accept that fairness that is imposed on us by law and that actually comes, you know, the, the Westminster system of government where um, innocent until proven guilty and all that, and the way the court system works, it was actually originally based on um, the, uh, if you look in the Bible, you'll see similar sorts of courtroom situations, not necessarily courtroom, but judges and think, pick guys like that who actually um, weighed up evidence. You'll see that all happening way back then. So our society is really still based on Christian principles. Um, for me, yeah, well, I, sorry, for me, I think, um, you know, I know I'm jumping a bit to conclusions, but or jumping to but if we look at the, if we look at um, the story of Moses going up on that mountain and mm. they had built a golden calf or a golden idol that they were worshipping because they didn't want to side with God, they didn't want to side with Moses. So those, when he brought them up and then he smashed those, um, Tenth Commandments because he was angry and God and he felt God's they felt God's wrath and you know they were deemed to you know wander the desert for you know for a long time and then mm. he put again the same Ten Commandments up and then you know sort of like you can see in our society you know not that it's similar to the Ten Commandments but we have as you said we have laws mm. and we have to follow those laws we have to obey those laws otherwise we end up in prison the otherwise thing, we get the, a fine otherwise we live our lives in a world that's you know in the future just about criminality not about saving oneself and it's not about you know God's law well the thing is about that whole story is the fact that um, Moses saw what was happening with the golden calf and whatever but he didn't mm -hmm. think that that the people that he that were around him were worthy of God's commandments, as if to say that God's this amazing being, and you are absolute scum. So I'm not going to help you because you're 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 actually acting like scum. So there's there's your tablets. It's gone now. You did that. So then basically he created a, a new um, ten commandments. Um, and, and, and he said, if you follow these um, yeah. letters, then you will get into heaven. So, but please don't screw this up. Yeah. Okay? You're on your, you're on your, you're on your, um, your last chances. I don't know about that. I, I don't know whether it was, you'll get into heaven if you follow these, 
Well, I don't think there's been a person alive who's followed all the Ten Commandments to the letter and got into heaven that way. It's more of a point of this is God's standard. And, and that was the whole point of the law in the Old Testament. All those little laws that were given were actually given. And, and Jesus um, revealed this when he came. He said um, he had come to actually fulfill the law because no one else could. And the point of the law was that, okay, this is God's standard. This is perfection. This is the way you should live. Guess what? You can't. Even the best of you can't actually get there completely. And so with God, it's either zero or 100%. If you can't be 100%, then you're actually not acceptable to God. And that's why they brought in these system of sacrifices where they said, righto, you're going to bring a lamb or a goat or whatever it was. And it was either a piece of livestock, which, which was actually cost you something. It wasn't the straggly old lamb that was no good at the end of the flock. It was your best one. You brought your best one and you actually killed it um, in the same way as people in churches these days actually give money, you know, give part of their income as, a, as an offering or as a sacrifice. It's something that actually costs you something, which reminds you that it all comes from God anyway, for the Christian anyway. So I don't know whether it was Moses was saying, well, you know, you, this, is, this is what you got to do to get into heaven. I don't think from what I can tell. Well, from my interpretation of Moses and the Ten Commandments is um, it's because he, he was a very much a, a problem solver. He would go around and he would try and be the, the peacekeeper of people. So mm. um, he could recognize patterns of behavior and he, he brought these Ten Commandments and said, here's what you're doing, but now it's codified. And so it's something that already exists and what you're got, you guys are trying to do, but now it's abstracted and you can fully, well, you can articulate it. Um, and yeah, with law, I think it, it derives off the same, um, mm. the same idea as, as God, like it's this transcendent thing that we follow. Like it, it, we're subjected to the law, but we're also, the law is limited by us. So, um, uh, and same with money, like where it, it's a transcendent, even though we have physical money, but the mm. a transcendent representation of our work. And um, yeah, so uh, uh, what did you say after um, a sacrifice? So with sacrifice, um, I think the, that's, it's, all through the Bible about sacrifice, you know, Abraham with the sacrifice of his son, even though it was mm. pretty intense to, to do that, but it, it's to represent um, the, like what Abraham was willing to do that he sacrificed a lot for a lot of his life to get to the point to have a son. Cause he had a son at like really old age. Mm. Um, mm. And, uh, and, it's his son like well, his he was only told son. To be the father of a nation he didn't have any children yeah yeah <laughs> um so it was like almost the ultimate sacrifice and um and then god mm. was like hey <laughs> i can see that you you're willing to do that so you, you don't have to do that <laughs> but mm. um it the idea is that um you know we we discovered time so going from chimps like it, took a long time for us to go from a gym to people saying you know i am conscious to articulating that um and if you so take the story of like say uh, a monkey how to catch a monkey is um you take a jar that's been weighed down and you put treats in there and the 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 uh the opening of the jar is just thin enough to put your hand in but once you grab the treat you can't pull it out and the monkey would do this and um one of the guys would go up and just pick him up because the monkey was not willing to sacrifice the part to preserve the whole and that's mm -hmm. the idea of what humans have discovered and articulated is we can sacrifice now for a better future so say when we're having mammoths and we're hunting mammoths um we could go i could keep all this mammoth to myself or I could share it to this other tribe. And then maybe when I don't have food, they might be 
more inclined to give me food so we can both survive and you know it, it's that sacrifice that idea of sacrifice and that must have taken like an absurd amount of time for humans to to discover that idea mm, that's um, awesome. yeah all righty next question um what are we taught about chaos and order in Genesis one? And is there extent is there an extension in other religions and cultures? Um, what I believe is that we're taught about chaos. Um, what I believe we're taught is that you know um, we all um, we are all made of you know what God brought us into this world for. I'm I'm not. Um, when it comes to chaos and order, I think I'll, I'll leave buckets with that one. Okay, so uh, it's interesting that we, we talked about um, basically God giving us a choice um, between. Um, uh, oh wow, we just got a gift from Zoom. Can you turn that off now. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that we talked about God giving us a choice because um, that is effectively chaos and order. Um, what, what, um, if you obey the law, that's kind of like, but all, but basically what everyone has to do, um, is just not Um, now you've done a bit of research. What can you tell me about that? Um, so with chaos and order, it's. It's very much akin to the, the yin yang. So um, you have uh, on one side you have chaos, uh, with which contains a bit of order. So order can spur from chaos, and from order, chaos can spur from order. Um, and so in the beginning of the Bible, there's you know uh, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and um, uh, the earth was our form or, or void so in that specific um uh, for uh darkness and void uh it relates to te home which is um associated with tiamat mm. uh so uh tiamat is a mesopotamian god that uh, is a female then it uh de- deity a female god that yeah that's it <laughs> uh uh, that is chaos of the world. So it's like this dragon figure, which um, kind of is akin to the serpent in some sense. Um, so Tehom in the Bible, uh, that's the chaos God creates order from. Um, and in the story of, of Time Act, there's this God called Marduk and all the other gods that were um, the uh, kin of these two gods, I think, um, Apsu and Tiamat, they were like interlocked, so chaos and order, or potential and order. Um, so Marduk was elected top god to to um, kill chaos because she was going to unleash this um, like chaos <laughs> uh, and created this uh, uh, accumulation of monsters to create. Uh, uh, a bigger monster um, or, or demons. Um, so Marak uh, said, you know, if you're like me, top god, I'll go out and, and sort time out. <laughs> uh, and they did that. And one thing about time is he has eyes all around his head and he speaks magic words. So this idea that, you know, if you think what a leader is, uh, how did we come up with the idea of what a leader is and a leader is basically someone who can see what the hell is going on and um be able to speak properly you know speak chaos into order for you know that is the basic uh explanation of what a good leader is so Marta he had eyes all around his head and he spoke magic words and what he did was he cut uh time at into pieces and made the world out of those pieces and that's similar to how god uh created the 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 universe like the idea is he formed chaos uh he he transformed chaos into order 
Mm. Um, and in some sense, that's what humans do. It's like we, so say we're at a starting tribe and instead of killing a snake, you go out into chaos. So the, the, um, uh, there's limitless potential of what might happen if once you leave the campfire, you find a den of snakes, then you're the hero of the tribe because instead of killing one snake, you've killed them all. Um, so it's, and then that's how you transform chaos into order and make the world out of its pieces. Um, so, uh, and chaos is both psychological and also physical because uh, chaos is say, for example, if your partner uh, cheats on you, you instantly, your whole reality falls to the ground because you're like, okay, uh, this used to be my house, but you know, like, where am I? Who are you? Because you weren't the person I thought you were. And that it, it, so it's both psychological and physical. It's, it's, um, because we're constantly building order in our, in our lives. And then once mm. uh, an event happens, so cataclysmic that it, it all falls down, then you're, it, it, it's, you're out in the wilderness. You, you, you gotta, and you gotta deal with it straight away. Cause you know, and that's, you know, why we, we freeze or we fight. Um, so, cause it's that, that, uh, that very inbuilt uh, mechanism or uh, instincts that we have to, to react to things because that's how we've survived because um, the Take your time. Uh, yeah sorry <laughs> Take your time. So, for example, um, there's something I found quite interesting. Um, was uh, a sort of view of this caterpillar and these monkeys, and um, this caterpillar, once it poked its head out, or, or like it, it looked like a snake head. Um, so, if you were some alien looking down and trying to figure out what the hell, what the heck's going on. Um, you see this harmless creature come up to these monkeys. You know these monkeys could just eat this caterpillar, but then the caterpillar starts acting, having the mannerisms of a snake. And then the monkeys recognize this and then scatter off. And then the, the caterpillar goes on its way to... Um, so we have inbuilt um, that have taken God knows how long um, to... to have these patterns of behavior like um uh like built into our bodies you know because we didn't become conscious before we had a body we had to develop a body before we had to become conscious so we're still steeped into our neurological system that has adapted over time and we're still in a sense controlled by these these like whether we um, yeah. it's the idea of uh, what ancients used to think about gods, you know. Um, so Mars, the god of rage, it's the god that possesses you that when you're angry because it not only possesses you, it possesses everyone and including animals. So um, it's this transcendent pattern of behavior that they've interpreted as a, a god that possesses you because it's thought in those days, people thought the world as a, a drama instead of more uh, uh, materialist, obviously. So there's um, these abstractions of how people act has been uh, abstracted into these gods. Um, and I think that's what the Bible does in the same way. So. Hmm. Um, so, instead of well, so basically what you're saying is basically when if you just imagine basically a football game right and if one fan gets angry 
they'll all get angry over the same time over, over the same thing because they're watching a game where their favorite team isn't doing so well. Um, yeah, it, and, and that that would be such a, um, yeah. Mars basically, or the god Mars, um, making everyone outrageously angry. Is is that kind of like? Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure um, there have been studies that have shown that um, uh, people's testosterone levels drop when their favourite team loses and rise when they win. So <laughs> it's quite, it's such a, so, uh, such interesting creatures because something as what feels so trivial can change us from, you know, being completely happy one day and then all mopey about and the other day, mm. oh, my team lost. <laughs> so it's like, um, yeah, and it, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's part of life, you know, um, it's part of the, the uh, yeah. well, it's built into us. So like, um, yeah. Um, yeah, dude. Okay, next question. <laughs> next question. All right, question three. From a scientific evolution point of view, where do you see the serpent, humans, and the evolution? Um, so kind of what I was saying before is, you know, with specifically with humans, like we've developed, uh, we've physically developed in our, our uh, neurology to uh, recognize snakes like especially in our lower vision because um, if we have repeated patterns of behavior in life um, then over time as we evolve uh, those patterns are built into our nervous systems um, and if you look at how far nervous systems have existed then like it's uh, like while we're still in the ocean, I think we, we, we still had nervous system. So it's a very ancient, ancient part of um, uh, us. Um, so, uh, so we, so for, for millions or billions of years, we've, I think 3.5 billion years we've had like an unbroken chain of of um uh life to get to this point um i might be wrong on that but um uh, so we've been doing this for a long time and like with nervous systems we've been able to recognize patterns of um the world and patterns with uh, other creatures and same species and how we interact with each other and then that's how we're able to to identify facial features like even blind blind people like uh their skin to, skin conductance uh changes when someone shows like an angry face or um a very intense facial expression so they can they're not consciously uh uh they they can't consciously see things, but there's still those inbuilt um, neurological systems behind it because it's it's so in, uh, steeped into our, our biology. Um, so we we act in the world, and that's how we we have these. So we have chaos, and then we act in that chaos and then we learn from acting and then that's then represented in a dream and then we articulate that dream into to spoken word or articulate knowledge um, so we act in the world and then that's shaped by a society and then we can model society um, and then that's how the dream gets its information mm. um, and then uh, with Carl Jung he's seen with dreams um, of his clients uh, uh, very similar to, to mythological stories um, and that's 
Kaohyung thought that was the birthplace of these these mythological stories was of the dream, the abstraction of of how he articulate the world. Um, well, we actually have evidence of so, that in Aboriginal culture, which talk about the dream time, and it seems mm, that all yeah. of the stories are based off mythological things um, that, yeah. for, for the um, best part, would probably be conjured up in your dreams. Um, and that's how they've symbolized yeah. a lot of things which they can't really explain, but they need to find a story about how things came to be. Was he? Yeah. Uh, well, there are common there are commonalities among, um, you know, the dream time and the stories in scripture. There are common factors um, that go back, you know, generations and centuries. As to how we how we look at the world and how we and what our fears are, um, which might explain why a lot of the films that are around these days seem to have apocalyptic images of big monsters that are very similar to what's written about in the Bible, which are word pictures anyway. Um, but there's certainly some commonalities there as to how we've understood the world and understood our place in the world and what our fears have been. Um, which I guess inspires our dreams because I mean, you know, I can rarely remember what I actually dream, but now and again, I can recall it when I wake up in the morning and it's actually, it's, it's based on my own experiences. So those things have been common to, you know, to man, whether, I mean, whatever form man was in, I mean, a good question is if, we're going to go back to the Adam and Eve story and Adam was created first. What was Adam when he was created? Did he look like a man does now? Or was he slightly different to that Ooh. until the woman was created, if the woman was taken from him? That's an interesting point, isn't it? What was Adam when he was made? My did he look like, did he look like modern man? My theory is, well, here's what, sorry, here's what I think is, that's, that's something right. I've thought about for a very long time is, was Adam and actually Adam and Eve were they actually human beings or were they? I know this is going to sound a bit weird coming from me. They, but, look, they, they but were apes. Think, were they? <laughs> no, were they cavemen? Because if you remember, I guess so. Cavemen are still humans. Then, yeah, but some say evolution began with God. Some say evolution began with monkeys or apes. Some evolutions began with cavemen. So were they actually cavemen? Because when they, when Adam and Eve were born into the world, she was born of his rib from the Bible. That's what it says, mm. she was born of his rib. That's why it's called woman. But the thing is, were they cavemen? Because they, they didn't have anything to wear. They were using leaves as to cover the, um, the nether regions, shall we say, you know, politely, respectively, the following. But they, well, they didn't have to do that until a certain rib. point. But what... My point was, what was Adam? I mean, if, if it is the case that God created a creature, because he was look, he's looking around, at all, he'd made all the animals and that, and all the animals were there, but there wasn't any, any of the animals to which God thought he could relate. And that's the point of the message of the Bible, if we're talking about the Bible, is actually relationship. Relationships are very important in the Bible. And apparently God created a, a, a being that he could relate to because he couldn't relate to any of the animals. And the question was, what sort of a being was it? If, if that being had been created or come, to be, come into being, what happened when it died? Or was that being such a sort of a being that could actually reproduce itself like a few animals still can? And when the woman was created, because it was realized that there was, no, there was one being there and there was, no, there was no companion for that being, and again, the animals were all checked out and even the monkeys didn't make the grade. That being was so intelligent like we are that it was, uh, that it was out on its own. It was special, mm. right? Um, special enough to apparently have a relationship with the creator. Mm. So um, and then another being was created. So the question is, I mean, to put it crudely, was Adam the first being a, a, hermaphrodite, a hermaphrodite that could that could have sex with itself and reproduce itself. And then when the woman was created, that was all changed around. Could be. Doesn't really matter, but it could be. Um, so yeah. what form was that first, those first people in? Then, you know, where did the 
and then apparently there was sons and sons born and then where did their wives come from do they just pop up out of the ground or were they their sisters who knows <laughs> so was there incest going on back then we frown on that today but what about back then, back then it, back again then. again there might have been a purpose for it so, uh, okay so we've got well, <laughs> what was that <laughs> Back then, incest was in, and we know that because all the world <laughs> were doing it, um, and even way. the Egyptians had birth defects because of it. Mm. We know it. that okay. it, it happened. But look at it this way. You know, in the Bible, you see many of them marrying their cousins and having mm. children, and that line of succession continuing in the Bible where they kept marrying their cousins because they didn't marry mm. a stranger. They married their cousins because... They needed to populate. They needed to, to grow the earth. That's right. Yeah. There's a purpose behind it. There, it had to happen because there was no one else there. Yeah, it had to happen. All righty, next question. Well, uh, well, what psychological... That's really fun. <laughs> so with Adam and Eve, from my interpretation, it, because the Bible says the first two human beings were actually Cain and Abel. So my interpretation is Adam and Eve isn't act, aren't actual people, but they're the... It's a story of the cataclysmic event of how consciousness came into being. So mm -hmm. going from being unconscious animals into conscious beings. Um, so it's the, with the fruit of good and evil. So because um, that's basically what we discovered. We discovered space and time, and where and then with uh, the clothes uh, covering ourselves up. Um, that's because we're self-conscious. We 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 realize that you know, like we're vulnerable. Um, and I know how I can be hurt, and that means I know how you can be hurt, and that means you know how I can be hurt. So let's like, and that's how you um, how good and evil comes into plays. So it was a gaining of I... understanding. It was a gaining of understanding, in other words. Like a, yeah. a, a, a coming of age, a growing up sort of process that they suddenly realised they needed to wear something because they were naked, whereas yeah. they didn't know that before. In the same way, a child, a baby, doesn't mind being naked until it comes to a certain age. Exactly. All right, realise so that it actually should wear clothes. Hmm. Hmm. So next question, because I'm not sure if we're going to get to all three, but I'll give it a good shot. Um, what psychological teaching... Um, or consequences can we learn from Cain and Abel? So again, what psychological teaching or consequences can we learn from Cain and Abel? Um, well, it's a kind of another story of uh, sacrifice um, and kind of the two beings. So there's first two beings of, uh, mm. in um, and one Abel he makes a bunch of good sacrifices and God is very, um, very happy with him. So he rewards him with women and um, like his crops grow well and they flourish. Um, but Cain, he makes all these bad sacrifices and then um, he expects the same reward, but then he, he doesn't get that. So he starts to, to resent Abel and resent God. You know, he blames god um and uh he retaliates in a way by by killing abel um so uh with sacrifice it's there's this psychological test uh, i think maybe some of you know it uh, the marshmallow test where so uh basically uh psychologist comes in and um they so Sorry, one thing. Explain the marshmallow effects on us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, and, I, and I want to make a test. They, so, they give a marshmallow to a child and they say, When I leave this room, if you don't eat this marshmallow, I'll give you a second marshmallow when I come back in. Mm. And then, you know, some children, they just straight in, like, but um, the. The other children they might like distract themselves and really sacrifice the first marshmallow in like in the present 
and wait until the future so they can get two marshmallows. So that's a form of uh, the sacrifice and as well as the monkey jar that we talked about. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically we sacrifice to, to have less suffering. And if we don't make the, if we, if we make sacrifices or live in a way that uh, uh, won't give you anything good, then there's, you've really got to steer away from resentment because it's very easy to go down that path. Um, Positive influences in a way. So if you, if, if you yeah. really, um, just, if you say, okay, don't take the marshmallow, you could probably symbolize that to say, okay, maybe in the investment world, perhaps, and say, um, look, um, if you invest this amount of money and not spend it now, I can promise you mm. in a month's time, you'll double your money. Yeah. And to a normal human, we can go, oh, okay, well, that means I'll just put um, lots of money there, right? Mm. But there's going to be you know, times where you're just going to think, I'm really, really hungry and I want to spend some money on a coffee. I don't care. I need a coffee. It's going to keep me sane. And so I'm going to basically take the money that I had said that I um, was, that they all said I was going to make double the money that I was going to get uh, out because I want that coffee. And I feel that um, I feel like it because that's part of my human um, sort of cravings that, that I always will always have. And I'll, I'll weigh that up to go, okay, this is what I should be doing, but this is what I need right now. And that's what mm. human consciousness is basically doing. Yeah. Is that basically what you're yeah. saying? And yeah. We've all been through that where we've kind of, I shouldn't spend this money, but, <laughs> and then you get taken out and then, yeah. So. Um, well, that's a justification of our actions yeah. now versus the reward that might come later. Mm. Um, we, we, we go through that process all the time. Um, in in what in how we act and what we do, yeah. So that's kind of largely akin to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if we think about it. So um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs: um, in order to fulfil any higher need, you have to basically fulfil the first lower needs, um, like sex, food, drink, shelter, clothes. Mm. Well, well, clothes is actually higher up on the list, but that but if, if you can't fulfill if you can't fulfill the lower needs first, you can't you you, you, you can't fulfill the higher. And what what will normally happen is that um, uh, you'll go up and down the list really really quickly throughout the whole day. Um, mm. It makes it actually harder to actually get up to the top, which is um, self actualization before actually, because you need to continuously fill these other lower needs first before getting to the top, which is just another way of looking at it, I suppose. All right, last question. I was and gonna say something, but, oh, go ahead, sorry. You were gonna say something? Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, just one last point is, um, it's with the Cain and Abel, it's not, you know, this person's Cain, this person's Abel. We both have a bit of Cain and a bit of Abel and our, uh, development over time may have made more cane than able or more able than cane, but we always have a bit of cane in us, or we always have a little bit of able. I'd so, agree with that. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. It's very yin and yang, sort of, if you think about it. So the little, oh, yeah. you always yeah. have a little bit of well, good, but a, a lot of bad, or a lot of bad and a little bit of good. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit of balance. All right, last Similar, question, but, question five, but I don't think we can. So question six for the night. Is the Bible, here's the kicker, is the Bible too graphic for children uh, as it has a lot of adult themes that would normally be unsuitable for children? And I'm going to squeeze in really tight and say, uh, is the Bible too graphic for children? Yes, because the children, as, you know, as the Bible, children, when they go, for example, Sunday school, they receive a Bible but it's all, you know, um, color. It's all the, it's the way simplified. To, I'm, look, and, the way it's written. It's written yeah. for children to think about in their minds, and the stories are all sort of, um, sort of 
uh, subdued due to their factor because if they were to see the graphicness in it, they're going to be traumatized for the rest of their lives and they're going to be crying mm. and, they're yeah. going to be upset and they're not going to be able to sleep. They'll have nightmares. So they dumb it down for children enough for them to psychologically mm. understand it. And the stories yeah. are made for them so that they're just children that can absorb children's stories. And as they get older, when they have their confirmation, then they get their uh, Holy Communion. They actually receive it's a good back. idea it's a good idea to un understand the context of those things in the bible and why yes, they happen um yeah. and i mean as far as children understanding certain concepts i mean no they can't but i mean actually there are certain stories in the bible like when when king david um got together with that woman who wasn't his wife and someone else's wife and then he had a husband killed because he was ashamed of what he was done um I told my children exactly what that was about. Um, I mean, it wasn't as if we were watching a movie and seeing it all, uh, all that happened in graphic detail, mm -hmm. but, and it's exactly the same with, with Jesus death with, um, you know, people being stoned and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, that was part of the culture and what went on. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think that uh, children should be shielded. Because, I mean, I, I think children are best off to understand the reality of this life as early as possible. So by the time they grow up, they'll know how to deal with it. I think that's my, that was my strategy as a parent. Um, and, yeah, I, as long as the kids understand the context of what was going on, it might be upsetting. But it's also upsetting when some kid slaps you at school and steals your bag, you know. But as, there as it is. Children, sorry, as children, I, I think that, well, I'm, okay, when you say they should know the reality of it, I'm a little skeptical on that because I think their innocence will be washed away and their <clears throat> childhood mannerisms will be washed away because as children, they have to understand that, you know, the children's Bible is better off for them mm -hmm. because when they get older and they have children of their own and mm -hmm. they read the Bible or they talk about religion at school or they talk about the Bible at school, or with their family or the priest, um, they they will have they will come to the realization of their own is what their uh, um, what their thoughts are, what their emotions are feeling, what the and even you suggesting that right um, is an example of a human being psychologically uh, working at bay, uh, not work actually working in the process, not working at bay or taking an action. So uh, basically, a, a human being to say a parent, right, <laughs> will always look at their child as cute and innocent and can't do anything wrong because, and actually Freud basically found this, that um, children can be a little bit manipulative and mm. that there will always be a kind of competitive uh, um, competition between a woman and a uh, woman's husband or partner um, and her child. Um, and, and that will always kind of, there'll always be a kind of competition that way because there will always be someone that's always number one. There can't be two number ones. Um, so the child will usually always get preference, right? And so because of that, um, and, and an adult will say, okay, I don't want my cute, adorable child um, seeing um, the um, terrible, 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 terrible reality or the images or reality of, of how terrible life is because I want them to be as innocent um, and, as pure. and as pure as for as long as possible. But mm -hmm. they have yeah. to grow up just like everyone else does, usually around mm -hmm. about adolescence and actually understand the realities of life. But naturally, because we are humans and uh, we tend to... Uh, want the best for our children and we don't want them to be scared at night and we want them to be safe and they want we want them to feel safe um we'll blatantly lie to our children and basically give them these storybooks mm. to make them feel um happy and wonderful and get the the message at the end of the day when the reality what mm. really happened on noah's ark was probably hell on earth um <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. um, um you go, sir. No, no, it's your turn. You take uh, the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely agree because um, I'll go on a tangent, but it'll come, it'll wrap back around. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel 
a good piece of fiction is as real as like numbers are real like numbers we made up ourselves but the uh, unbelievably correct abstraction of the world um so i feel like the bible is akin to uh to true as numbers are true um mm -hmm. just on a much more abstract complicated way um and with teaching children this you you don't throw them straight into calculus like <laughs> you start them with the basics and then you build up from there as they they learn more mm. so yeah i think the um you know in the same way as the message of mathematics is understood by children in stages as they go through and i, I never quite got calculus i never saw the point the, the moment that my maths teacher in year 11 put an equation on the board which proved that x equaled y when there were different numbers i thought this is ridiculous but um <laughs> i never quite got there but in, in the same way as children understand mathematics and they know how to add up and then they know how to subtract and division and that and by the time they get into high school they're going to more complex um, mathematical formulas i think the message of the bible is there and can be understood by children with uh, the stories that are there that they can be told without necessarily going into the gory detail of everything the basic yeah. message still hangs together so that's that's good exactly. enough yeah because children are quite imaginative like mm -hmm. if you just uh do you create a, a correct representation of what the story is trying to to tell mm -hmm. without all the gory details then then that's that's because what we're talking about is really really in depth and a child's not going to understand that so it's n no point in telling them all the details so yeah <laughs> wow well this has been quite the uh, educational informative thought-provoking interesting fun what are your thoughts well my thoughts uh jordan is that i know we discussed this earlier but um for a long time now we've actually been discussing a cat space um award um for someone who comes up with a really really good Brilliant idea, idea. That, we, <laughs> that we can use and so we're actually awarding, awarding that award and yeah. actually sending that to <laughs> when it's ready. When it's ready you can basically um, uh, get your address and um, send it to be, you and yeah. work out how much the postage is to send this thing. But um, um, if you come but, up with but, other ideas. But if, yes, if you come up with any other ideas and you're out there <laughs> um, and we can use it, then you might actually get an award as well. So, so don't know forget. Are you talking to me? Everybody. <laughs> Everyone. I don't really, really don't worry about awards. I've never, I never really win them because I, I I'm too much of a. Uh, well, how can I say it? I'm, I'm too much of a. Um... Inside job, Pauzy. Okay, so one <laughs> last thing to do is to uh, subscribe and to hit the notification bell, uh, so you can see all the podcasts. Invite your friends. Please share the podcast. Comment on any ideas of fun or thought thought-provoking conversations you want us to talk about any ideas mm. you want to win an award and we'll give you a shout out as uh you know young jordan here decided to have this brilliant idea of thought-provokingness of the bible and i think that was very informative in education and um educational educational <laughs> sorry um <laughs> conversation so i'm thankful for that uh, i want to wish you both a blessed easter and uh, Yes, happy Easter. It was a very, it was a very thought-provoking discussion. Thank you, Jordan. And we'll see you right. in a week sometime. Thursday. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jordan. Bye. Bye, Jordan. See ya.